From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Let's review the last four months in Rhode Island. Former House Speaker Gordon Fox's home and office raided by state and local authorities. A new leader in Nicholas Mattiello emerges in its wake. Vincent Buddy Cianci bursts back onto the political scene in yet another run for mayor. And the 38 Studios controversy continues to hang around like a bad house guest. Keeping with tradition, lawmakers work into the wee hours on a laundry list of legislation, including eliminating the master lever and the Sakana tolls, dropping corporate tax rates. Oh, and calamari is crowned the official appetizer of the state. In other words, a normal stretch around here. In the thick of it all, our guest this week on Newsmakers, Rhode Island's House Speaker, Nicholas Mattiello. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the panel, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Mr. Speaker, welcome back to the program. Oh, always a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having Glad me. Glad to hear that. You know, <laughs> as a matter of fact, the last time we had you on uh, was the beginning of the session. You had to ramp up very quickly uh, to get going after uh, all the hoopla that happened, to put it mildly. Uh, now that's in the rearview mirror, your first session under your belt, what would you say is the one thing that you're most proud of from this session? I'm most proud of the budget. I'm most proud of the fact that post March 25, when I was elected speaker, we had roughly 90 days. We passed a very bold, aggressive budget. We uh, we lowered the corporate tax rate from nine to seven percent. We raised the threshold on the estate tax to one and a half million dollars and and uh, removed the cliff. It's a bold budget. It's going to help businesses and it's going to help our job creators stay in Rhode Island. So I'm, I'm very pleased. We're going to get into the budget on this program. We actually have a lot of specifics to get into. But uh, before we get into all that, once again, the session went into the wee hours. Um, the, the lawmakers were considering bills 2, 3, 4 a.m. You know, we know that a lot of them don't get a chance to fully read them, fully vet them before they're actually voting for them. Is this how you think the legislative process should happen? Well, let me say this. On, we, we kept to our curfew uh, every night of the last week of session. Um, we had fully negotiated all our bills the, 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 the evening before. There were only a few bills in play. All of the bills went through committee months earlier. The members were relatively familiar with all the bills. I certainly was familiar with all the bills. And it's a matter of negotiating with the Senate. The House prefers to pass some, the Senate prefers to pass some, and we decide which ones we both want to pass. Most of the business, even on the last night of session, was concluded by, I think, roughly 11 o'clock. Beyond that, it was just negotiating with the Senate on the Newport Grand Bill. So there was that one bill, and the terms of that were actually negotiated the night before. We were just looking at the terms, and we were looking at potential changes, and as it turned out, we went with the terms that were negotiated the, the night before with the Senate, and so there was really no change that evening. Most of the business, I, and I don't want to be fact-checked, but I think by 11 o'clock, 95 to 98 percent of the business was done. So we, we really didn't have that late-night session. We were just holding on one bill. Uh, so are you comfortable with that process? I mean, often maybe it was a little bit better the session and the perception was it, it went late, but as you say, you were considering one thing. But there's often that flurry of bills and sort of the last minute wheeling and dealing, that can't be easy on the rostrum for you either. Are you comfortable with that? Well, it's, it's, it's hard work. There's no question about it. I am comfortable with it because it's, it's realistically all I know. I've asked around <laughs> as to what other states do, and I believe every other state has a session that's very similar. Uh, that has a part-time legislature, you mean? Yes, and every legislature at the end really has the flurry of bills, and there's a reason for that. Everybody has a different priority, and it's like cramming for an exam. You, you cram at the end, everyone has different priorities. As you're working towards adjourning, all of the priorities come forth, and you have to deal with the, the, with the members' priorities. And we're all happy to do that, but as you're doing it, there's usually a flurry of bills, and, and there's always negotiation between the House and the Senate. In each chamber, we have to decide which bills we want to pass, which bills are priorities to us, and they may be different from the other chambers, so we have to work together. And as that negotiation occurs, we d determine that we're going to pass X and Y of each other's bills. I want to go back to the budget. Um, it's got your, the budget has won a lot of praise. One uh, dissenting note we saw in the Providence Journal this week, Tom Segoras, the liberal policy analyst, published a critique where he said, quote, 
Economic development for years has meant only tax cuts for rich people and real estate development, and that's pretty much all we're getting again. Uh, how do you respond to that critique? Well, my response is the, the government should never pick winners and losers. What we try to do is create a good environment for everybody to, to succeed, to, to create economic growth. I believe that's what we did. You want to keep your job creators and, and your well-to-do folks in the state so that uh, they can... Uh, give to, to charity, uh, invest in companies, create jobs, and so forth. So I think if you create an environment that welcomes everybody to stay, then your economy is going to do better, and that's what we've tried to do with this with this particular budget. You also know that the budget, um, it's you're still facing large and growing deficits in the coming years. Uh, more than a hundred million dollars next year, up to over four hundred million dollars by 2018 if the Massachusetts casinos come online, which now is a question. Uh, do you expect you'll have to raise taxes to reduce those deficits and get the budget back into balance? No, I'm not. I'm not looking to raise taxes in the future. My goal is to continue to create a better economic environment and atmosphere and to grow our economy. I think the way we work on reducing that structural deficit is to do things differently. And this budget was the first budget to do things differently, to move in a different direction, to create that better economic environment, better economic activity. I remember when I first became elected, my first term was in 2007, and our revenues were dropping like a rock. And that was through the loss of economic, ac economic activity due to the recession, just as, as easily as we lost revenue, we can pick revenue up. We need a better economy. We, we need more small businesses. We need more large businesses. We need more middle class people working. And you know, when you get back to the, the question about winners and losers, the middle class person that has three kids to take care of, uh, even though he may not benefit from the estate tax, he or she, if he or she has a company that decided to come into Rhode Island or stay in, in Rhode Island or have a job created that stayed in Rhode Island, gave that person a job, that person and that family is going to be much better off. So that's the direction we're going to work in. More economic activity will create more revenues, will create more jobs, everybody will be better off. If, if, if economic growth, though, isn't enough to offset all that, it sounds like taxes are very low on your list of how to sign that. Are there parts of the budget where spending you think you'll have to look more closely at if it comes to that? We always have to be good stewards of, of taxpayers dollars and we will look at that the reality is even though it's an eight plus billion dollar budget a lot of the spending is fixed and there's not a lot of areas to look at anymore but we will always look at efficiencies and and making cuts where appropriate we have to provide essential services and we'll continue to do that and if you look at this last budget it was very balanced we took we took care of the business community and we also took care of persons that rely upon uh, the government for their their social service needs how do you feel about Vincent Buddy CNC running for mayor I'm going to leave that to the, uh, the uh, taxpayers and the voters of the city in Providence. Uh, he has a right to run. He's a very interesting pe person. He's got a great personality. He's very gregarious. But uh, as far as uh, whether or not he should run, that's a personal decision that he should make. And the voters in the city of Providence are going to be a judge on whether or not it was the right decision. Yeah, but Speaker, you, you talk about wanting to make Rhode Island a, a business-friendly state. That's a priority for you, bring jobs in here. You know the headlines that are going to emerge out of this nationally if he wins mayor, that, uh, that Rhode Island voters elected a, a convicted felon back into office and the second time around was for uh, public corruption. Are you concerned about the message that will send to companies or businesses not only looking to move into Providence but into the entire state? Well, Tim, I'm going to leave that to you to analyze and to report on. What I will say is, yes, I'm always concerned about the image of the state. What I've said, and it, it goes to 38 Studios and every other decision and issue that we look at, I am most concerned about the, issue, uh, the image of the state of Rhode Island. I want to have a good economic environment. I want companies to come in. I want the citizens to be, feel proud of this wonderful state that we, that we live in. So anything that could compromise that, I'm always concerned with, and I'm not going to be the judge of what's going to compromise it or whether or not Buddy Cianci's candidacy is going to compromise it. It sounds I like will, you don't want to be the judge in this case, to be honest with you. There are other items you might judge yes. regarding, but this one, what, why, are you, that, why are you being safe with it? That's fair to say. I, I'm just going to leave that decision to the voters of the city of Providence. You've run for office a couple of times. Do you think he can win? I think if it, it, I think he certainly can win. I'm not going to project him the winner. You don't want to be an analyst right now. I'm not. I'm not an analyst, <laughs> but he's he's a strong, viable candidate. I would suggest. 
Fitch Ratings uh, announced last month that it now says it will not downgrade Rhode Island if the to junk status, even if the state refuses to pay the 38 studios bonds. You just mentioned 38 studios. Uh, that's contrary to a report commissioned earlier this year by the Chafee administration. Has that announcement from Fitch made you reconsider whether we should keep paying the bonds? You did support it this year? No, absolutely not. I, I was never of the opinion, and nobody ever said, the S&P and Moody's never said they would downgrade us to junk status. They said we would have a substantial multi-notch potential downgrade, but uh, certainly everybody agrees some downgrade would be in order. I, I believe we made the right decision to preserve the image of the state so that Rhode Island is not the second state in the union to ever default on an obligation. We maintained our willingness and uh, ability to maintain and pay our obligations. That's going to preserve our reputation, better our economic environment as, as we move forward. Rhode Island has to have the reputation that it keeps its obligations, whether it's relative to bonds or whether it's rel relative to business uh, businesses. When it makes a promise, it has to keep its promise. And as long as I'm speaker, that's going to be the case. Now, when you talk about 38 Studios, we also just had a settlement. And that settlement was predicated upon the fact that we appropriated the money. I'm expecting future settlements. There's a few, uh, at least two other defendants that I think will settle. I believe. I, I mean, I'm not going to promise that. I believe. But is that what you're hearing? I'm, I'm hearing that, and my, my, I'm an attorney. My, my personal uh, legal analysis of the situation suggests that that's a likely outcome. Who are the other outcome. two that might settle? I believe it's, uh, I believe Adler Pollock and Sheehan is a defendant, and Kurt Schilling. Kurt Schilling has a policy that's got five or six million left An insurance on it. policy for yes. liability. Yes. Um, so th those policies are in play. I'm not going to suggest what they're going to do, but I'm hoping that uh, we'll receive settlements from them also uh, shortly. And uh, there's Wells Fargo. They're, they're a defendant with very deep pockets. You don't need an insurance policy with Wells Fargo. And I believe that lawsuit will go to trial by the spring. So Rhode Island will have an outcome uh, uh, relative to the lawsuit. I'm hoping that we, we reclaim uh, most of the money, if not all of the money damages. And that would not have happened had we not appropriated the funds. We're uh, coming up against a break, but I want to stick with 38 Studios briefly here. Several weeks ago, you were contacted by the Colonel of the State Police. He wanted uh, information, contact information for members of the General Assembly so detectives could interview them if they had any other information to share regarding 38 Studios. The State Police have an active investigation there. Have you been interviewed yet by detectives? Yes, I have. And when was that? A uh, week and a half, two weeks ago. What did you tell them? I, I gave them background uh, relative to uh, my tenure in the General Assembly, what committees I've served on. I gave them background relative to the General Assembly, uh, the individuals in the General Assembly. Uh, what I knew relative to 38 Studios, which was more or less after acquired information. And uh, I it was as cooperative as I could be. And uh, I, they thanked me for my, my cooperation. And, and uh, I told them, feel free to call me back if anything else comes up. Based on their line of questioning and what you shared, do you have an idea of where their investigation is headed? Well, they asked me about certain individuals, like which who? I'm not, I'm not going to mention. There's an ongoing investigation, so I'm certainly not going to mention that on a news uh, program. But they asked me about certain individuals, so I have some idea of where they're looking anyway. Uh, I don't know, I don't know uh, what they're looking at specifically, but I, I have an idea of where, who they're looking at or who they're asking questions about. Do you think you were helpful in terms of whatever the scope of their investigation was? Did you provide information that was worthy? You'd have to ask them if I was helpful. I provided as much background information as I could be to attempt to be helpful. And do you know of any, before we go to break, do you know of any other uh, lawmakers that have been interviewed by the state police? Yes, I, well, I, I know none specific are coming to mind, but several, several lawmakers indicated to me that, uh, that they were contacted. Okay, we, uh, our guest this week on the program is House Speaker Nicholas Mattiello. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my right, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Our guest this week is Rhode Island House Speaker Nicholas Mattiello. Mr. Speaker, um, this week, online news site Go Local had a report that more than half of the 20 magistrates that are sitting now have ties to or war, uh, were former law lawmakers. Unlike judges, magistrates don't have to go through the Judicial Nominating Commission, which vets appointments for judges uh, to make sure that they're, they're qualified. 
Magistrates are essentially judges. Do you think they should go through the JNC? That's something that you could always look at. I haven't formed a firm opinion on that, but I've, I've thought about that myself. Uh, I'm, it's certainly something I will consider as we move forward. Uh, but I haven't made a, a, a final decision. Generally speaking, um, former legislators, I think, make very good jurists because they, they've learned how to work and deal with their constituents over the years. They've learned how to compromise. And I've always found that the judges on the bench that were former legislators are great judges. We have a lot of lawyers in the state, though, and the optics of that are its patronage. No, I, I think everybody should have a fair shot at the judiciary. I, uh, sometimes I get the feeling that you're excluded from being a judge if, if you're a former legislator. I think former legislators are great judges. There's great attorneys out there that are not former legislators that'll be great judges. So I think everyone should be given a fair shot at, uh, at the selection process for a judge. So correct me if I'm wrong, there are two vacancies for a magistrate now. The House budget gave the judiciary less money, apparently because of those vacancies, if I read that right. Look, there's this unwritten rule that leadership gets a say in who gets to be magistrate. You're a speaker now. Do you want to weigh in? Do you have a pick for magistrate? I, I think that uh, everyone involved in government's ultimately going to have a say. I don't need a, a specific say in the magistrate. You don't have a name in your pocket? I don't personally right now. There's no. We didn't fund the magistrate, so that's not an issue until next year. So, no, I don't have a name in my pocket. Uh, have you talked to the chief judge of, I think it's district court, and is it family court that has the other vacancy? Superior court, I okay, believe. Okay, uh, my apologies. Have you talked to the, the judiciary about that? Have you met with them? Yes, we've had conversations, and I told them early on we have a difficult budget uh, for this, this year and that I was looking at not filling those, and we, we did not fund those magistrates. So I actually asked them to hold back on uh, making selections in those because I didn't know that we had the resources to make the long-term commitment. I, I, you know, I know they, they have some difficulties uh, with, with their calendars, but I think there's, there are enough jurists that they can easily get by and serve the public's needs. And when the budgets uh, be, be become easier to manage, then we'll certainly look at refunding those positions. But right now, the resources weren't there, so I haven't given a lot of thought to who I think would be a good jurist for those positions. One bill that passed at the end of session and Governor Chafee has signed that I, I to be honest, didn't realize had been on the fast track was, uh, or the track to pass, was provides a $4.8 million bailout effectively from state taxpayers to retirees in Central Falls, increase their pensions, which of course were cut severely in the city's bankruptcy. Um, why did you decide to support state taxpayers, you know, helping to fund pensions in the other 38 cities and towns when that one did not put the money into the pension fund that was necessary to fund those pensions? Well, Central Falls is a very distressed community, and you, you're looking at first responders let's let's be clear these were first responders mostly police officers firefighters who at one time or another put themselves at risk um, put their their life on the line to serve their community these are very humble pensions these are the, these are persons that retired a long time ago their pensions were twenty five and thirty thousand dollars before they were cut in half so now you're taking first responders that serve their communities and in their elder years are, are forced to go on welfare and social services when they worked hard to serve their community. I think that's an appro uh, appropriate appropriation. I'm very pleased to do that. And I would always look at someone in like circumstances with a helpful hand. So that goes to my next question. You know, many other cities have heavily underfunded pension systems, and there's no guarantee that we couldn't see another bankruptcy or another situation where pensions are cut. Would you also consider using state taxpayer funds to, to add to those pensions? They're all going to be different. Um, I think Central Falls is very unique. Central Falls, as I said, they're twenty-five and thirty thousand dollar pensions. Uh, you know, for people that have served a long time ago and that are in their elder years. Most pensions today are at least double that, and they're certainly not coming close to being cut in half. So, no, I would not consider that for any other community. Quite frankly, this is not creating a precedent. We are not doing it for any other community. If there's, if there's a retiree that's a first responder that's receiving between ten and 15000 in their pension, yeah, we'll consider that. But there are no other folks in like circumstances. So the reality is, no, we'll never consider that again. And just uh, quickly, Senator Ryan Pearson passed a bill in the Senate uh, that died in the House that would have required cities and towns to actually fund their pension plans. He worked with, uh, I know, Director Gologli on the language because the House had concerns, but it did not pass. 
Um, you know, why, why not pass a bill that would force people to fund the pensions now when we're also having to pass ones for places that didn't fund it? Quite frankly, I don't remember the specifics of that bill and what the, what the negatives of that bill were. I'm sure they were. I would certainly encourage every community to fund uh, their pensions. I, I think there might have been some, uh, some penalties in the bill that uh, some communities were going to be forced uh, to incur without the ability to fund their pensions. So that might have been the reason we didn't do it. I strongly encourage every community to, to fund their pension obligations. It's the right thing. Uh, to do for the employee from from the taxpayer point of view because you don't want to create unfunded liabilities and obligations but um, I don't remember the specifics as to why we didn't uh, we didn't pass that particular bill education you said you read a story in the Providence Journal about a Barrington girls difficulty in getting a diploma and that was the reason for your change of heart uh, on the kneecap as a graduation requirement uh, now that story was obviously heartbreaking uh, but it's also an extreme case do you think we should really be setting statewide policy on that one student? No, and, and that's certainly not what we did. Uh, long before that case, I, I had a conversation with Ride, and I asked them to find alternate pathways for, for folks or students with developmental disabilities. They're going to have a particular difficulty on a standardized test. Um, I've been learning for years that NECAP is not the best uh, high stakes test out there. What about we're, Park? Which we're is moving coming down. to Park. Park. Park is uh, uh, an applied knowledge type of test, so it's more appropriate. I think most as a graduation requirement. Just want to be clear. As a graduation requirement, absolutely. This was a unique situation where citizens, educators, administrators, everybody felt as though we were not exactly on the right path. And, and I resisted, I resisted uh, the change. I, I resisted passing the bill, delaying the implementation because I thought a lot of good work went into the implementation of a standardized graduation requirement um, and that I didn't want to derail that effort. But when the waiver process proved to be faulty to me, then I, I became more and more concerned. And at the end of the day, the students have to be put first. And what troubled me about the waiver process, a kid that scored in the 20% range and improved to 25, 30%, would have shown an improvement and been eligible to graduate. If you were in the 50th percent range and you didn't, you didn't show improvement on the second time around, you, you're, you're not able to graduate. So people with higher scores could actually be denied a, a diploma when people with lower scores would be. It, it was just a, a failed system. Um, I think a standardized test is certainly helpful, will certainly improve our education process, and we're never going to derail that process again. But at the end of the day, the obligation of the General Assembly is to look at every state issue um, even and education issues that should be addressed somewhere else and put the students' needs first. Some and might say micromanage the, the Board of Education and the Commission of Education, though, that that's what happened with the General and, Assembly. And that was a concern that I, I, I shared. Uh, I didn't take this action lightly. It's, it's an action that I should never have to take again. But the student's interest has to be put first. I, I think that everybody was moving along with the standardized test, and when, there, when problems developed, I think the policymakers should have looked at those problems and, and made changes. And those changes were never made, and ultimately we were forced to act, and that's what, that's what we did. But that should never happen again. I will say that, that, that uh, the Board of Education and, and the Department of Education certainly have the students' best interests at heart. They are, they're on the right track. They have the appropriate policies. I support their initiatives. However, this particular test and how the waivers were being implemented wasn't done equitably and fairly across the board, and there was no pathways for people with developmental disabilities. And for that reason, we were forced to act. All right, we're running uh, low on time. I know you've said in interviews already that your priority next year are going to be jobs in the economy again. That's your mantra. Absolutely. But do you have any uh, specifics about what that actually means? Uh, there's a lot of different ways to impact jobs in the economy. What do you actually want to look at legislatively next well, year? I'll tell you what my plan is. I'm not going to tell you what the specifics are. I've mentioned some specifics. We'll look at the corporate minimum tax. We'll look at at the 
tax on utility bills for businesses and um, and, and those are just some ideas that I'm looking at right now, but what I plan on doing is visiting our universities, visiting our economics professors, talking to experts, and asking them once again, as I did this year, where does the state of Rhode Island get its best bang for the buck, and what, what do you recommend we move forward with? After I talk to the experts, I'll talk to my leadership team, I'll talk to my colleagues in the House, and we'll, implement, we'll implement a plan. We're also going to have a new governor. We'll, we'll chat with the new governor about the best way to move forward. So uh, that, that's my plan for moving forward. Always rely on the experts and go where the facts and the evidence leads you. Should the New England Revolution move to Rhode Island? Absolutely. Would everyone, you, <laughs> everyone should would move you to Rhode Island. Would you provide some sort of incentive, government incentive, to make it happen? In 30 seconds, we'll, I apologize. We'll look at every particular situation. I'm not going to make any commitments, but every, every group and organization and business out there should co consider moving to Rhode Island. We, we have a great state and we're going we're gonna to be as business friendly as we can. And Rhode Island is a unique place. You can meet with the governor, the speaker of the house, the senate president, and whatever other government leaders you want uh, in very short order. Okay, great. House Speaker Nicholas Mattiello, thank you for joining us on the program. Most, most of you are watching on a Sunday, so we hope you had a happy and safe 4th of July. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We will see you next week on Newsmakers. Perfect.